a dehumidifier, an absolutely enormous dehumidifier, so big that that's the reason I haven't taken a look at it so far. It's because it just wasn't quite going to fit in the bench. It just barely fits in the bench. The box was much bigger. That's what kind of threw me initially. And this was sent by Christopher, and he said that initially he got this from Lidl. And it worked initially, but then after a while it started giving problems and then conked out. Christopher also stuffed as much chocolate as he could in the box, including, well, not just chocolate, but cookies as well. Including this particular cookie here, which, uh, well, it's very big. It's an enormous cookie. It's such a huge cookie that I've estimated its calorific value at over 3,000 calories. Mmm, maximum calories. This image is also swamped out because it's really up high, and uh, this thing is a dark case. This is what happens. However, we can cut straight to the chase. I will be opening this, but let's find out what the problem was. Well, the problem was that he said there was the signs of a distortion around the connector. If you look at the power input pin here, it is uh, it's black. It's really burnt. And the matching pin on the power supply is also uh, distorted and burnt here. It's notable that this is obviously a common thing because it says... Plug fully inserted, tick. Plug not quite fully inserted, cross. I wonder if it's just that they've basically had problems with the fact that this thing runs about 5 amps and it's been causing problems with the plugs burning up. The instructions with it. It's very typical of these type of uh, units. The instructions here are Dutch. I did mean to cut the French instructions off because I reach, read French much better, but it doesn't really matter. The French instructions about the other side, I completely didn't spot it as I was like slashing the carton up before binning it. So we'll read it in Dutch, relatively speak. We'll just extract the information you need. 65 watt, 400 milliliters a day, based on an ambient temperature of 30 degrees Celsius, which is absolutely swelteringly hot. That's the upper safety limit of office temperatures and 80% relative, relative humidity. And what they mean there is that the thing works best in smelteringly hot temperatures and damp air. That's just cheating a bit. It's not going to take that much out in a sort of lower temperature. It's got a capacity in the water reservoir, 1.5 litre, automatic uh, water reservoir control with a lamp and the switch, presumably. Um, and thermoelectric thermoelectric peltier element. So it is the solid state uh, peltier element. Okay, the power supply does work. It's putting out 12 volts on the slightly charred connector. I would zoom out, but I can't zoom out. I am zoomed out absolutely fully. We're just going to have to work with what we've got here. The water drawer slides out, and it's got the little float in it. Let's pull that off. The little float that pops that pin up. It's got a little bung for emptying it, so you can just pull this bung out, empty the water out, and then shove the bung back in again. And here is the little uh, funnel that channels the water into that. Inside the unit itself, let's get all these bits out of the way. Inside the unit, we've got the very common arrangement here, that there's two micro switches. One detects when the drawer has been pushed in, the other detects when the water floats too high and cuts the unit off. So this one, do they have? This one's got a very gentle operation. This one's firmer. I would guess this is power, and this is the water cut off. I could actually check that. Uh, which way does this go? Yeah, this is the one that presses. That is right. The stiff one is the power, and the soft one is the float one, because it's not going to put a lot of pressure against it. To get this open, um, I don't see any screws in the back, but I see a trim in the front that is possibly hiding screws because there are pillars inside that uh, look as though they're covered. So I think this is going to be quite destructive. I think I'm going to have to try and push these clips in to try and get the trim off. I will focus down shortly. Uh, if this takes too long, I will try, I will, I'll pause momentarily, just because uh, this could get, it could be one of these trims that you undo a certain number of them, and then when you undo the next one, it immediately all clips back together again. So far, so good, but I don't like to, I don't like to hold my breath in case things go wrong. Now we're on to the ones that you can't access the clips. Is it going to come out? Is it going to come out? What do we 
doing here? What are we doing here? Do we have more clips that... We do kind of have more clips. I'm wondering if a spudger would help here. Handy if you need to get this off. Handy to know. Uh, I'm not, not sure there's any place to actually really spudger in here. Oh, here we go, here we go. Yeah, right. Oh, that gives us access to the whole darn lot. Right, okie dokie. Let's just nudge the focus down a tiny little tad down here. Here is the fan that is drawing air... Uh, how is that working? It's drawing air over those vents. Is there a fan on the other side as well? Where is the bit that's actually taking the moisture? I reckon this is going to be the hot side. Uh, let's try and undo some of those screws down there. They're quite deep down, so I shall use one of these screwdrivers for that. These might be the completely wrong screws to be doing this with. Maybe I should take these screws out. Are these? I think these are just trim. Is this going to work? We'll find out in due course. There's a little power marshalling board, but that literally is all it does. It's just a power distribution board in here. So let's get that screw out and that screw out. And we'll see if this does lift out. It might not lift out. If it doesn't lift out, rather than faff around too long... Oh, that's not lifting out. Uh, I may end up just... Um, Pausing momentarily and uh, working out how to take it out. You know what? I may just do that. One moment, please. And we're back. I did take the trim off because it turns out that the trim has little lights at the edge here. Uh, that's the light guides. And a little circuit board that clips in. And uh, the only way to get the connector off that from here is to actually... Well, you don't have to take the circuit board out. I took the circuit board off just to show you. It's got two resistors, two LEDs. There's not much to it. It's just a little indicator PCB. But once you've lifted the trim off, it also gives access to the cabling going down to the incoming connector, the connector that's damaged. To lift that out, you unclip the cable from under these little hooks here. And there's a wedge here, a little sort of ratchet clip that you have to tilt the connector that way to lift it out. Uh, if you lift it straight up, it, w it won't come out. But once you've uh, tilted it to the side, it will come out. And uh, you can see slight shininess in the plastic there where it's melted. But this gives you access to change connector or just replace it for something much more functional like a bit of terminal block or whatever you want. To get this out, it was the two screws there and the two screws here. There are four screws holding the main set of chassis bit in. But then to get it out, you have to lift it up, push the micro switches in. Um, and that it's quite tricky, really. It lifts out a degree. You push the micro switches in to ride them past this plastic trim here, and then the whole module will come out. Let us take a look at the module and see how it works. So this is the classic Peltier-based unit. It's got a little circuit board, but it's not doing an awful lot. Its main function is purely to marshal the power out. There's a little capacitor on it. I'm not really sure what that's for, but it's not really that significant. It's possibly, since this is putting out DC, I'm not really sure. Maybe it's just, um, I'm not sure why they've got the little capacitor there. Um, there's not a lot on it. Uh, we've got the two switches that are basically both going to, this one needs to be in to actually allow it to operate. This one, when it gets pressed up, will stop the unit. So they're just sort of, there are only two wires going to that. One to the normally open, one to the normally closed. The fan will power up when the thing is running. And there's also, there's a heat sink on this side, underneath this fan. Well, actually you can see the fins out there. That's the that's the heat dissipation heat sink. But the bit that the water condenses on is this heat sink here, which is the uh, the cooling, the condensation heat sink. And the way it works, if I hook this up, and it is just 12 volts. So I shall hook positive onto there and negative onto there, and I shall power it up. And I'm only powering it at 9 volts, just so it doesn't go completely wild. Um, 
if you press the enable switch in, the fan starts running. And after a while, you can't really detect because it's certain, it's been cooled by the air flowing past it. But you can't detect the heat off this one yet. But if it was left running for a while, you would. But this one, after a very short period of time, it gets notably colder. Even in this house, which is already very cold, that is getting icy cold. It's getting so cold that ice could probably start forming on it. Which it probably could happen, really. Right, so we've got a cold side, we've got a hot side. The fan is actually pulling air in and across that, and venting it through here. So the path of air into the unit is in the front grill. Then, I'm just looking here, it goes, so the air comes in through the front grill of this and it passes over the cold side first and that condenses moisture out there. The air then flows under here and this fan is sucking it in from that side. The fan then blows the air through because it rotates in this direction. As I'll just demonstrate that. You can see... Is that really showing? Mm, no. It's rotating in this direction so it is pulling the air in from the other side round the case and then in over this heated surface to keep the hot side cool and then it's blowing, venting out the unit. So the point of this here is that a Peltier junction, let me just see if I can expose the Peltier. Let's use the correct size of screwdriver, that would be even better. So under here we're going to see one of the very, very common thermoelectric plates with a bit of heat sink compound maybe. Maybe even a spacer, maybe not. Lots of heat sink compound. A plastic frame to hold it position. This square plate here is one of those Peltier Junction plates. Let me show you one of those plates. A Peltier plate. It's two wafers of ceramic with a sort of goo round the edge. And inside is, oh, and a wee corner chipped off, a series of what are effectively thermocouples zigzagging up and down. And a thermocouple is a junction between two dissimilar metals. This is the best of my knowledge. I've never really explored these things too much. But uh, as opposed to, if I was to heat this up one side of it and cool the other side, this would generate a small uh, current. I actually would generate quite a high current and a decent voltage. But uh, what they're doing in here is they run it in reverse. They power it. <clears throat> And well, it is TEC, thermoelectric cooler, that is the function of this particular type. And what happens is this side will get cool and the other side will get hot. You have to keep the hot side cool uh, because if it reaches too high temperature, it can damage the, uh, the couples inside, the junctions. But basically speaking, one side will get cold, the other side will get warm. The... Air is being pulled across that cold surface to condense and then drip down into the tray. But then, to keep the other side from overheating, that cold air is then passed by this fan over the other side with a great big heat sink to keep it sort of cooled. And that it's not efficient, so the, the, the hot side is uh, much larger than the cool, cool side. And it just basically, it's a, a device that just creates cold on one side and hot on the other. It's quite remarkable that it can do that. Um, and if I was to push this in now, the fan is running. This side is going to get very cold very quickly. Yes, it's like absolutely painfully cold. Okay, interesting. That compound isn't great. It's not exactly what you call moist. It feels quite solid. I suppose it's done its job. I think the temptation would be to add a bit more. That is totally dry. Is that intentional? Or is it just age or, or the manufacturing? Uh, but there we have it. Uh, to fix this, you just basically, you could maybe, with, if it didn't uh, melt the terminals, you could maybe just file and solder some wires on here. Or just open the case and whip this connector out and uh, replace it with a new connector or something improvised. But inside there's not a lot to go wrong. They're not efficient though. One nice thing about them though is that, uh, I'm just looking at the these little wires for. Where's the fan? What is inside there? I'm intrigued. Is there a 
a thermal cutout or something. Right, okay. I think we have to investigate this. One moment, please. It looks like a single shot thermal fuse, so if this side gets far too hot, if it gets blocked, and the temperature rises too high, it will kill the unit completely and permanently. Well, unless you know about this little device under here. Well, that's a bit naughty. The device inside is an MT Tech Thermoelectric Cooler 12750S. Uh, hold on. 5. 12705T125. BC 2018, so it's not that old. Hmm, interesting. So dry. Uh, but they're not efficient. However, one good thing about them is that they will operate at low voltage. They, you know, although they're rated for uh, 12 volts, if you were to run it at lower voltage, it will still have that differential effect. I'm not sure at which point it will start taking water out of the air, but it means that if you had a remote cabin somewhere that had a humidity problem and you were to put a solar panel up just a 12 volt solar panel just dedicated to this then no matter what level of sunshine there was it would just run at a speed um and it, the the amount of water it took out would probably vary beyond a certain voltage but certainly in indirect sunlight it would be just continually running in the background taking moisture out particularly if you added a wee drain pipe to the uh to the drainage unit or just had it plumbed a pipe direct well yeah plumbed a pipe either directly into this or into the actual the little bucket but there we go. Um, it's a. It seems a design weakness. This the dry thermal compound is a bit shady. Maybe I, I suppose maybe that silicon rubbery type thermal transfer sticker would have been quite good there. But there we go. Um, I've taken it apart. We've seen inside. We've seen that the problem is, and that's about it. Interesting devices, but as I say, just not very efficient. If you want a real dehumidifier for a proper house application, get a compressor-based one if you're in a very hot environment, or if you're in a very cold environment like this house in winter, uh, get the desiccant drum ones. They'll pay themselves off. You know, they don't last forever, but they'll pay themselves off in a relatively quick time because they're just so infinitely more efficient at drawing water out than these uh, solid-state ones.